today we're going to look at an interesting object known as hyperreal numbers. And maybe one of the most interesting aspects of the hyperreal numbers is it allows you to do calculus without limits. So you can define the derivative without using a limit. You can also define the integral without using a limit. So let's maybe look at the definition of the hyperreal numbers. And I've put definition in quotes here because this is maybe not as careful as something you might see in a textbook, but it will give you an idea for what's going on. So the hyperreal numbers denoted by star r are real numbers together with two other types of objects. And that first type are infinitesimals and infinitesimals are smaller than any real number. And of course, by smaller, I mean in absolute value. And so that means if you have any positive real number x, so I mean any positive real number x, then we can find infinitesimals between zero and x. Okay, and then we also have something called infinities or infinite numbers, and these are larger than any real numbers. And in particular, we're going to want to use the following two objects. One is an infinite number and one is an infinitesimal. And we'll call the infinite number omega. And it is also the smallest infinite ordinal. And so what we have is that omega is bigger than x for all real numbers x. And then we'll define an infinitesimal out of that and we'll call that epsilon. And that'll simply be 1 over omega. Now I'd like to point out that by this definition of epsilon, we have epsilon is bigger than 0, but it's less than 1 over n. And this is true for all natural numbers n. So of course, in the real numbers, there's nothing that you can fit in between 0 and 1 over n for all natural numbers n, but in the hyperreal numbers, you can fit infinitesimals in that space. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a picture of what's going on here. So in this centerpiece right here, we have the real numbers. So that's just the standard real number line. And then if you take the entire real number line, you can squeeze that into what I'll call a neighborhood of zero in this kind of larger number line. So this larger number line involves all of the infinite numbers. So here we have omega, here we have two omega, three omega, and then back in this direction is minus omega, minus two omega, so on and so forth. And I said this includes all of the infinite numbers. In fact, it doesn't because you can keep going higher from here, but we won't do that in this video. And then if you descend from the real numbers, so if you look at a neighborhood around zero of the real numbers, you can find all of the infinitesimal numbers. So we've got epsilon in there, two epsilon in there, three epsilon, negative epsilon, negative two epsilon, and so on and so forth. So now we'd like to look at a definition which will help us find derivatives using these hyperreal numbers. And this definition says that if x is a hyperreal number and it's finite, so if it's finite, it only has a real number part and an infinitesimal part. It does not have an infinite part. Then the standard part of x is the number, which is a real number that is closest to x. So let's look at a couple of examples, starting with a very simple one. So the standard part of 2 plus epsilon is simply equal to 2, because that's the closest real number. The standard part of 3 minus epsilon plus epsilon to the fourth power is equal to 3. That's because epsilon and epsilon to the fourth are both infinitesimals. And so the closest real number here would be 3. Okay, well let's look at a little bit more interesting of an example. And that would be the standard part of 1 over 1 plus epsilon. Great. So you might guess that that should just be equal to the number one, but we need to show that carefully. So let's see how we might do that. I'm gonna do this with an inequality. So let's take one over one plus epsilon. 
And let's notice that this is less than one over one. And that's because one plus epsilon is larger than one because epsilon is larger than zero. So we've indeed made the denominator smaller in this hyper real number world, which means we've made the whole thing bigger. Notice that's equal to the number one. Now I'd like to multiply the numerator and the denominator here by one minus epsilon, and let's see what that'll give us. So now we'll have one minus epsilon in the numerator and one minus epsilon squared in the denominator. Now we're gonna do another inequality here, and let's notice that this thing is larger than one minus epsilon. And it's larger than one minus epsilon because its denominator is smaller. Here the denominator is one, but here the denominator is one minus epsilon squared. So now what we'll do is take the standard part of all pieces of this inequality. Really, we just have to worry about the two ends and the center part, which is the part we're interested in. And we'll have the standard part of one minus epsilon, well that's just simply equal to one, will be less than or equal to the standard part of one over one plus epsilon, which will indeed be less than or equal to the standard part of one, which is simply one. So we've pinned the standard part of one over one plus epsilon between one and one, which means the standard part of this must be one. So I'm kind of pulling a fast one on you because when we take the standard part, this strict inequality doesn't hold anymore. It turns into a non-strict inequality, but we're not gonna go over why that is super carefully. Okay, so before we move on to using hyperreal numbers to take derivatives, let's go ahead and prove a very simple result involving hyperreal numbers. And this simple result is how the standard part operation interacts with maybe some standard operations on hyper real numbers. In this case, case, we'll take multiplication. So let's look at our claim over here. If X and Y are finite hyper real numbers, then the standard part of X times Y is the standard part of X times the standard part of Y. So let's see how we could do this. So let's maybe set x equal to a plus something that I'll call epsilon naught. We don't know exactly which infinitesimal we need here. The infinitesimals we've looked at so far, this infinitesimal epsilon, but there are other infinitesimals. So I'll just call it epsilon naught. And a is a real number. So let's maybe write that down here. So a is a real number and then epsilon naught is an infinitesimal. And now let's do something similar for y. So we'll have y equal to b plus epsilon one. Again, we've got a real number plus an infinitesimal. Great. And we know that if we have a finite hyper real number, we can always decompose it into a real part and an infinitesimal part. We just don't have an infinite part like we would in general. Okay, so now let's look at our standard part of x times y, which is equal to the standard part of a plus epsilon naught times b plus epsilon one. But now if we multiply this out, we get the standard part of ab plus epsilon naught times b plus epsilon one times a plus epsilon naught times epsilon one. But then an infinitesimal times any real number is always an infinitesimal, and the product of two infinitesimals is also an infinitesimal. So this tells us that this is an infinitesimal. Great, so that means we have a real part, this a times b plus an infinitesimal, that means that when taking the standard part of this, we just get a times b. But that's exactly the standard part of x times the standard part of y. Now before we move on to looking at the derivative, I'd like to recall the way that we can define the special number e inside of the real numbers. And what do we have? The number e is defined to be the limit as x goes to zero of one plus x to the power of one over x. So there are many equivalent definitions of this number e, but this is definitely one of them. 
But the way we want to do this is to put this in terms of infinitesimals instead of in terms of limits. But if we're taking the limit as x goes to zero, we can just replace that x with an infinitesimal. And we can replace the limit with the standard part. And that's generally the idea here for how all of these things work. So this is what we'll take for our definition for e within the hyperreal numbers. We'll take e to be equal to the standard part of 1 plus epsilon raised to the 1 over epsilon. But notice we could also rewrite that as of 1 plus 1 over omega raised to the omega power. And that's because e has an equivalent definition as the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x power. So let's see, this first way of taking the limit corresponds to this first standard part operation. And this second part corresponds to this second standard part operation. But for our purposes, we're going to hang on to this first part. Okay, so that being said, let's look at how we could define the derivative. Let's first recall that the limit definition of the derivative is as follows. We have f prime of x is equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. But now instead of taking a limit as something goes to zero, we can replace those objects going to zero by an infinitesimal, and then we can replace the limit with a standard part. And that's exactly what we have up here. So we have f prime is equal to the standard part of f of x plus epsilon minus f of x over epsilon. Where here I'm using our special infinitesimal epsilon, but really you could really put any infinitesimal there. Okay, so now let's check that this produces the same sort of results that we would expect when taking the derivative. So let's first check that the power rule is satisfied. So let's maybe set f of x equal to x to the n, and let's notice that f prime here is equal to the standard part of x plus epsilon raised to the n power minus x to the n power over epsilon. But now we'll expand that x plus epsilon to the n power using binomial expansion. And that's going to give us the standard part of x to the n, and then plus n times epsilon times x to the n minus 1, plus epsilon squared times a bunch of other stuff. And in fact, we don't really care what that other stuff is, because it'll all like cancel out in the end. But that other stuff is related to the binomial expansion. Okay. And then we still have to subtract this x squared part, and then we'll put this all over epsilon. Great, and now let's notice that this x to the n cancels this x to the n, like that. And then we've got some epsilons that can cancel from the numerator to the denominator. And that'll, in the end, leave us with the standard part of n times x to the n minus 1 from that quotient plus epsilon times some other stuff left over, which is again related to that binomial expansion. But now let's notice that this is infinitesimal, which means that we end exactly with what we want. We have n times x to the n minus 1. Now we're going to do one more example, but before we do, I'll leave you with a little bit of a homework exercise, which is to calculate the derivative of the square root function, so the derivative of the square root of x using this infinitesimal definition. And now we're going to look at our last example, which is taking the derivative of the function e to the x. So I've left this over here where we have our number e defined in terms of this standard part with infinitesimals, just so that we can recall that as we make our calculation. Okay, so I've set g of x equal to e to the x, and now we'll find g prime of x. So that's the standard part of e to the x plus epsilon minus e to the x over epsilon. Great. Now we're going to use 
exponent rules, which I guess I haven't proven work with the exponential function, but needless to say they do, to separate this out as e to the x times e to the epsilon. So that'll give us the standard part of e to the x times e to the epsilon minus one after factoring some stuff out all over epsilon. Okay, so that's starting to look good. But notice that we've got the product of two hyperreal numbers here in a standard part. So we can apply that claim that we had before and break it into the standard part of e to the x times the standard part of the rest. But let's maybe real quick assume that x is a real number, so the standard part of e to the x is also real, just for the sake of argument. So this is gonna give us e to the x, and then we'll have the standard part of what's left over in here. But now I'm gonna take this e to the epsilon and rewrite it using this over here. But let's notice that this power of epsilon here will cancel this one over epsilon here, giving us one plus epsilon minus one over epsilon. Great, so just to reiterate what happened, because it happened kind of quick, e to the epsilon turned into this one plus epsilon. Notice we're kind of missing a standard part here, but we factored it out and we combined it with this standard part here. But now let's notice that one minus one is zero. We have epsilon over epsilon, which is one. The standard part of one is one. So in the end, we have e to the x, which is as expected. And I think that's all we'll do today. But like I said before, you can do other things with calculus involving the hyperreal numbers, including defining integrals. Maybe post in the comments if you'd like to see a video on that. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.